Hello, I'm Katie Wicks and I have a memoir that's out this week called Delicacy. So to celebrate the fact, I've decided to sit down and chat to some interesting and talented people about some of the topics that I write about in the book. So today I'm discussing reading and the writing process and influences with Matilda Winnick. Matilda is a writer whose own taste in books was heavily influential on the writing process for me and I've really enjoyed our discussions about books over the years so I'm really chuffed to be chatting with her today. Hello Matilda. Hello. <laughs> Something that's actually quite significant about the fact that you're chatting with me today is the fact that also the books that you've recommended to me over the years have been incredibly helpful, if not the the door that allowed me to like it was like a door opened and I was able to write a book, I think partly because of your recommendations to read people like Anne Boyer, who I know you love, and Maggie Nelson, and more recently, some of the books we talked about, Eve Sedgwick, Marie Cardinal, and I think I remember once you, I think you said The Golden Notebook was one of your favourite books, wasn't yeah. it? There's an introduction that she's written, and she says something in the introduction about that you shouldn't, that the way reading is taught in schools is wrong and that you should read in this new way where you should you should be ready to come to a book and that it's not good, you have to be the right age to read it, which I'm just discovering is so true because there's books that I read when I was young that I've reread now and it's like, oh my God, this is a different book. Mm -hmm. um, but also, and again, I think this is what she says in the introduction and it's a really hazy memory of it, but about how you should one book should lead on to another in this very organic way and that's sort of how I read now. Did you read a lot whilst you were writing? Whenever I was stuck I think I'd just go and read and either you know like an image would be really arresting or like a really surprising word like something it would just trigger some image or something in my brain. I just started reading like mainly women's writing and a lot of memoir and it served like loads of different functions I think sometimes it would uh, jog a memory because I'd forgotten so much of my own life or just a really incredible description or or something that would help me or, or just the way a sentence was like constructed mm -hmm. I'd sort of go oh okay I sort of understand what they've done there mm -hmm. I'll steal that yeah, so it was really helpful. <laughs> it, it was really nice to hear you saying that reading more of these books that pay closer attention to like the kind of feminized yeah. realm or even yeah. just um, more like emotionality yeah. kind of gave you permission. Yes, I think you were saying it, to like write about yeah. those kind of details. It was absolutely about permission. It was also a way for me to feel less like, God, I'm so emotional. Why am I so... Mm -hmm. It was, like, helpful to see how other women deal with being so emotional and yeah. alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think, yeah, I just remember, like, my kind of archetype, the opposite of that is, like, someone like Hemingway, where it's so pared back and there's, the, you know, the emotion is there for the reader to supply and, like, impregnate the book with, and it's this really, like, you know, in some ways enviable, like, masculinist posture that he holds, and then I think I had an edition of, um, of um, Farewell to Arms, where right at the end like just when you've read the final like you know completely kind of like penetrating line then it's like on the next page it's like and here are some other endings that i wrote and they're all like crossed out and they're all so bad and they're also so emotional wow. and really like hysterical and it's just really strange like um like all the subtext of the actual finale is then like brought to the surface and it's like you know, my heart was really broken or something like mad like that. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking like, that kind of emotionality can be like held at bay yeah. and pushed out. And I think the process of editing, I mean, I don't know if you feel like this, but sometimes can be about pairing it back. Is it the case that the process of editing is like the process of removing the unconstrained emotion? Or is that oh, completely yeah, that false is... setup? Well, at the beginning, um, I would avoid being too emotional and avoid uh, like I didn't want to be sort of sentimental that I started doing sort of weird research where I thought I was going to put all these facts in and it was going <laughs> to be like did you know that the first cake was <laughs> in like 16 or it was going to be like 
I, I mean, I, I like read a book <laughs> called like Cardiff Suburbs in in the nineteen hundred. I was gonna like put all these facts in. I don't know. And I was That's gonna go to like the British Library every day and just read. Really so that was like my original plan. I think it was because I was avoiding, you know, writing about m- myself and avoiding exposure. So once I got over that, it was actually taking out some of the the remnants of like facts or weird tangents. Right. So it was actually it was the opposite. The opposite. It was right, like yeah. just you know like it was um this paragraph that this is interesting, you know, you just sort of said this expand on that feel expand. It was like the opposite. That's I think. so interesting. That's- I think on the like the Marie Cardinal that we were talking about what's it called the words to say it. Yeah. Words to say it, yeah. Um yeah. Which what- we should say if no one it's like a really intense French book <laughs> about um, about, about Freudian analysis. Yeah, yeah. And what's and remarkable about that book, like, is that it's um, kind of chronological. It's, it's like a, it's like I mean, accounts of healing. There's that. Like, there's a demand for, of the structure in a way to like kind of replicate the process yeah. of healing. Yeah. And it be, that book does it almost like one to one. Like yeah. similarly with the Eve Sedgwick, which is a journey through analysis. Like analysis is one of the few processes in life which is kind of um I want, it's obviously not linear but like it kind of accumulates almost yes. and so with the it's the, the Marie Cardinal is the closest thing I've read to the experience of analysis where like yeah. you feel like you're healing Absolutely. with her and that she she will like refer back to stuff expecting you to have a memory of it almost yes. as if you're her analyst that's so um, true. Wh- to, to call myself beloved, it's like that as well. Have you ever read that? No, no. Really, really similar that you're just in the room with her and that the relationship between her and, and it's sort of like a love story yeah, almost. Yeah. That book was really helpful, the Marie Cardinal, because of her lack of shame, was really, really helpful. Like, there's such an authoritative voice mm-hmm. talking about what was done to her and mm-hmm. how she. Yeah, and she kind of discovers her body in that as well. Yeah, she? and it's so unapologetic and so much like intense detail um which made me think oh yeah this is this is important mm-hmm. to it this is worthy of writing about i read a uh, strange land tracy emmons memoir about 10 years ago I read a long time ago which i i loved and i love her and i feel so much affinity with her and um and i think that's partly because like her book quite famously her memoir the, the spelling mistakes were left in, which I think is really vulnerable and something I could never do. And my spelling's really bad. But also there was a review and it was another, it was a woman and she said something like, they were talking about how raw it was and the review said, I just wish it had been edited by someone that loved her. And that, that terrified me and really wounded me when I read that because that implied to me that um, there was such a thing as being too much and that it was like this reviewer had sort of looked away in disgust it also implied that she hadn't sort of curated this as like she does with her other autobiographical work i sort of thought well i've asked loads of people to read bits and no one said to me don't write that so maybe no one loves me enough to tell me not to write this and so it was like Loads of just crisis upon crisis <laughs> after reading that review. When you said that thing about, like, I wish it had been edited by someone who loved her, for me it create, creates the idea of an editor who either doesn't love her or is, like, hostile to her or is maybe mm. um, scornful of her, which is a really disturbing thought. I mean, Yeah, like she wasn't being protected or something. Yeah. That, that's a terrifying thought anyway. What was your experience of being edited like? Did you feel supported? Yeah, I mean, my, I'm really... I think I was really lucky in that my editor was really... Well, he was patient, that's the main thing, because I missed every deadline. Um, And gave me so much freedom. Um, And I had... I mean, I did a really sort of... I think the the smartest thing I did was to have people that are uh, smarter than me read stuff and (laughs) correct it for me. But I was thinking about, as well, the fact that I... Yeah, it's like the, the vulnerability not only of what I'm writing about, but showing your what you think is good writing to the world is equally vulnerable and the idea of having this kind of rustic writing that someone hadn't corrected. I guess you set up this 
idea that the first version of the book is this kind of like raw outpouring of like unedited un unwritten almost unfinished material and then the, the process of making it into a book is like a kind of like loving person protective person who helps I guess kind of scale back the vulnerability or the exposure and kind of packages it in a way that will protect the writer like that's the figuration that you set up and that's so interesting to me because I think reading your book it felt like the everything was so artful like that it I think partly because of the comedy and because of the structure of it things felt yeah. so kind of finished and um not polished but like just I guess crafted because that's what I guess like joke writing kind of is yeah I I was just about to quote something that Roxane Gay said because I'm reading Hunger at the moment um and she said something about not making things too beautiful so that you don't like miss the the pain mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. And I, I thought, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Because I, I felt the opposite, that I felt like in order for someone to keep reading and to be interested, I had to like give them something, mm-hmm. whether it be like beauty or like a joke or something. Mm-hmm. It had to be like more than just this this hap- this thing happened to me. Um, I want to tell you about it. Um, yeah. But also like, interestingly, like reading that book, made me think about how writing about my body is also incredibly vulnerable like she she does it so well in that book and that's like another like just one of the things I find really vulnerable but I'm sort of glad I did because I don't think I've ever written about my body like publicly before and that that was actually really really hard harder Mm. than harder than writing about something that's been like done to you by someone else and it's really obvious that you you know, that it was someone else's doing, but I think writing about self-destruction and, and also about, you, yeah, that, that was, even talking about it feels really vulnerable. Yeah. But it was interesting. I don't know why that was. I think maybe because I think when you have problems with food and your body, it's like you're expecting your body to speak for you. And it's like trying to do the opposite of that, pin it down on a page, felt like really horrible Mm -hmm. compared to years and years of like you know yeah my body will do this for me yeah I guess it makes me wonder like is the analogy between kind of getting dressed or like the pressures that you Mm. describe as a woman of like presenting yourself in a certain way to be seen as like you know tidy and clean and all these things um and that and and making your thoughts and experiences into something that's finished and like you say will will like give the reader enough to, to keep them engaged like I guess is that analogy sound or is it not I don't know but the way that you describe like I guess the Tracy M thing is like almost as though the shame is kind of yeah. adjacent to the shame of being like a woman in a state of undress or a woman who's like spilling out from her clothes yeah. or like you know who who hasn't you know it's like I guess a child who hasn't been dressed well, you might think that there's no one who loves them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I remember oh God, like yeah. going to like school this one sort time. Of scruffy, dirty yeah. thing. And the teacher being like, um, brushing my hair for me and saying something like, you know, where's your mum? Whatever. Mm, and yeah. feeling, oh God, like, have it, I not got it's that? So editor? exposing just thinking about it. Yeah, it's and I guess it's that thing as well that we talked a little bit before about the whole thing of wanting to be seen and not seen. Mm. Um, whenever I'd feel shame I'd feel shame about the shame and I'd be like I shouldn't be feeling like this I'm entitled to write this story Um, so shame is is always present Um, but yeah that that thing of wanting to be wanting to write about it and not wanting to write about it it, it's a little bit like being uh, thin and being fat at the same time it's like really yeah there's loads of yeah one of those skinny fat people or fat yeah, skinnies yeah <laughs> did, you, did it but then do you get some relief from that feeling once it's actually published like when you're once you're no longer engaged in the question of like what to be written and what to be erased is it is are you now like free of that the talking about it and the publicizing it i've realized is a whole nother thing as mm-hmm. well which i didn't really think about um and again it's been it's it has been fine and you know, like I'm doing it right now but um, I, I guess that the first few times uh, that I the first few times somebody said something where they really misunderstood it was like this real shock right. um, 
to me because I've only shown it to a few trusted people who I knew would sort of get it. Um, so having to let go of it being out there and then people saying something a bit clumsy or just using a word that's not quite right and then being like, how, why did, how did they, where did they get that from? That wasn't mm -hmm. my intention at all. Um, but yeah, there is some relief in it being done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, being sort of partially healed or as healed as you can be before you write about stuff, I think is like something I've learned in that, because I feel like I'm quite old to publish a book my first book <laughs> so I think that's a really good thing that I've had all these years to process it in therapy and uh, before writing about it and I think being in having the structure there of having therapy has been really I think it's been really helpful and I I thought um, I'm gonna like book extra sessions in when it's like coming out and stuff like that just so we can talk about it. and she was been she's been really She's been really interesting around it, actually, because she keeps... Um, there was some stuff... This is a bit of a tangent, I'm sorry. I'm talking too much now. but Because um, there was some, there's a lot of stuff I, I left out, which, again, reminds me of the Tracy Emin thing of... As if she had not made any choices. <laughs> what to put in and what to put out. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and I really, really did. And um, there was some stuff I left out, and it was kind of to do with male violence and I remember my therapist sort of said why are you protecting <laughs> why why is society yet again protecting this <laughs> and I was like okay well that's quite harsh because you know it's a first book I just I can just get used to putting this bit out of my life like that that's enough for me you know and knowing that mm -hmm. that I'm not sort of uh protecting someone by not writing about it necessarily mm -hmm. Um, but I thought that was quite a bold thing of her to have yeah, said. Yeah, God, that's really hard to hear. I feel so <laughs> challenged by that. I mean, I guess it's as if you have an obligation to t tell the whole truth in your book, which, of course, is, like, an absurd idea. Yeah. Um, and the way that you describe, like, choosing to edit stuff out, you know, you, you describe it as, like, a kind of setting, setting a boundary or, like, yeah. maybe making quite, like, an empowered choice. But then is the accusation that's coming from her that you're doing it not for yourself, but to protect their yeah. reputation or their status or something like that. I think her implication was like, oh, this is like how family systems work. Right, that it yeah. always gets like yeah. somehow uh, justified or silenced. And, yeah. and we, we had been talking anyway about um, mm. how silence feels safe to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And it still does. So this yeah. feels like, this. it feels quite radical just in my little universe to have said anything mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> Yeah, but then I think the the picture that you like present in the book, like there's no illusion or suggestion that the vantage point of of you is at all like authoritative or like you don't have a sense of you seeing a lot. Like mm. you often position yourself in these situations where, like the, in the in that amazing chapter where you you d you describe a sequence of walks nodded. with your dad. <laughs> what? I just nodded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go on. Which one? <laughs> Let's um, sing, yeah. Where you know it's the one about your father and the like the series of walks that you go on and um, the muteness that you experience there is like really, you know, you're like pace, a few paces behind him and you're like full of these questions about his life and who he is and he doesn't yeah. seem to turn around and like respond to you. And so like you are really clearly like, like trying to, I guess, reproduce that feeling of being a child and where there is so much that's not known about and yeah. there's no one turns around to you and goes... Yeah. Right, this is how the world works. Yeah, yeah. It, I guess it's it's a mysterious age, isn't it? And and um, yeah, I think that that's that's so true that I don't I didn't um, set out to sort of say that I knew anything. Like I didn't mm -hmm. think that was my job anyway to sort of uh, like my my nightmare would have been to present some sort of argument or or something, you know, have this really like clear although I think it's really you know clear what I think and feel about everything that's happening to me in the book but um yeah I'm really able to write from from about that age probably because that's the age you you know I think with any trauma you get stuck at certain ages don't you mm -hmm. famously it's not you know I guess your therapist saying like there's male violence is kind of completely missing there is that instance of male violence there's one instance I think where in the psychiatric hospital where you know your father has that 
yeah you, know, you, you learn that there's that female nurse that's been attacked so but it's like very much held at bay and like i guess the capacity <clears throat> for male violence is there throughout the book and patriarchal violence is yeah. there felt and embodied the whole way through but it's kind of you, you it's more inter- interested and invested in i think like describing how things become silenced or yeah. how like the experience of being the the therapist was so kind of on onto something though in that i i throughout the whole thing i the the need to protect my father was greater than the need to protect my mother and it's so i don't know it kind of shocks me to even think that that's true but it's it's just it's so it's so true um yeah which i think is it's exactly what she's sort of talking about i think this is how the how the dynamic worked in my family, yeah, and what what I felt like my role was. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone was to be like, "What's this book about?" I think I'd probably would say, like, if I was under pressure, I'd have to be like, "It's about bereavement or like the loss of two parents," which really doesn't yeah. capture what the book is about. But it's yeah. kind of there are these like big plot points almost yeah. that everyone accepts are like milestones of life that kind of orient, you know, the book orients around. And then I feel like with the like recently reading that Eve Sedgwick dialogue on love which is like I said this account of her experience of analysis at the end of her life and I found it so hard to read and I was like why am I finding it so difficult and I realized it's because like she is both at the end of her life and at the very beginning of an analytic relationship yeah and I'm like in the middle of my life hopefully and in the middle (laughs) in the middle of an analytic relationship the middle is really difficult beginning beginning of life (laughs) no but just like you know you're like i guess you leave well i'm also really institutionalized because of my like you know upbringing in like school so it's like you know you leave those institutions which tell you exactly where you are and then for me like your 20s is an exercise in figuring out like where am i in my life like you know whereas i wonder if you found in some ways like maybe it's quite dark suggestion but that like the bereavement kind of authorized you to produce a memoir yes there's something really really sort of piercingly sad about starting analysis at the end of one's life Mm -hmm. because as you say you associate it with with sort of rebirth and new beginnings and and going in for a reason it's it's yeah it's really moving but then on the other hand i guess it's almost as though it should be a kind of like institution of death like there also are bad deaths like in this book i guess you maybe you had a bit of time with your with your mum but like it's not like i think the reckoning with your dad happens before he's ill like you 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 get that time together but there's no like you know, because you're going to die now, you can sit down and like you'll have someone dedicatedly going over everything you've experienced and yeah. helping you. Like, yeah, no, the re- I think you can do all you can to have a good death. That is true, and also I, I feel really, really lucky that nothing was so unresolved with either parent, even with my friend's death. There was nothing so unresolved that it's like haunted me because I think that uh, relationships. Even when you're not close to someone, the, the grief can be more complicated than if you were, you know, really close, even though it's incredibly painful. Um, I think with complicated relationships, the grief is somehow exaggerated even more. Or if you weren't speak, like I've had deaths where I wasn't speaking to the person when they died, and you know, that's more haunting than, you know, someone you were really close to and you got to say goodbye sometimes. I, d- I didn't make that point very clearly. But um, it's almost like <clears throat> as someone who isn't in that rigorous process yeah. of like healing or like grief, there can be almost like a kind of envy of people knowing where they are, like even to know that we're at the end of your life or you, to know that we're at the beginning yeah. of a relationship. Right. Um, the difficulty is like obviously staying with it in the middle. But I wondered if like you felt that, because when did the deaths come in relation to like when the book was commissioned? You know what's really weird? I was saying to someone the other day, because someone was, I think a journalist was asking me about specific dates, almost like they didn't believe me. I don't think it was that, but I was thinking, why do they, why do they care? And then I realised that, like, my memory, and I think it's like a PTSD thing, because it all happened so quickly, and was, it, and it was like I was in a post-traumatic state after it happened, definitely. It's like, I, why would someone expect me to remember the name of that year when this thing yeah. was happening? Yeah, no. And like 2000 and something, I don't know, it happened. <laughs> so sometimes I get the dates muddled 
and it sounds like I'm lying. No, but I genuinely like. I don't think of these as num- like having numbers attached yes. to them. No, but I, I just I, like yeah. when I meant, I when I think I meant more like, and then these people started dying, and now I'm here. Yeah. that's how I remember it. But I think you once told me like a, a, a kind of like funny story about <clears throat> being commissioned to write a book about cake, and then during that process, like when yeah. your parents dying, and then the book changing. Yeah, is that absolutely. is that what my I'm... my friend had already died. So I knew that I was going to... Like, I went in with, like, a few facts that I'd definitely write about my car accident. I'd definitely write about my friend dying. So there were these, like, definites, because they were the only interesting things that happened to me. So, uh, yeah, it really quickly became like, oh, right, I'll put all this other stuff in as well. So the challenge was finding enough, like, padding (laughs) with the other stuff in between, like, a, a big sort of climactic Mm -hmm. life event was yeah the sort of padding but I mean there's not that like linear journey for you as much I mean you're not modelling how to heal it's not a self-help book it's not like no well the other thing I I think is is kind of weird and it is it's linked to vulnerability as well is um, this that I that I struggle to write about joy or I don't think to ever write about it yeah (laughs) um not to say this is just a kind of list of, you know, miserable things that no. happened to me. There's things in between, but um, I think it's because actually it is so vulnerable to write about joy, and that's really private because uh, it's so they, it's it's those kind of fleeting joyful moments that I really are like for me and the people I experienced it with more so than the pain, which I just think is kind of weird, but. Um, it, it's strange how I think maybe it just seems less dramatic somehow to write about the about joy. It just wouldn't have occurred to me, but I think it's so important to so that it just doesn't become like pain, pain is synonymous with like a woman's life. Yeah, <laughs> it's like full stop. Yeah, well, that is yeah connected to this question of like how do you write about pain without fetishizing it or like yeah claiming I think in this historical moment now particularly like the association of of like womanhood or strictly speaking white cis womanhood with with pain yeah is obviously like mobilized to you know exclude and shore up like a really specific idea of what womanhood is which can be so troubling so I feel like you know obviously this has been going on for many years but it's like no sooner have you had me too and you feel like there's an invitation to identify in some way with like a collective narrative around womanhood and like pain or at least um painful experiences that then it's it becomes co-opted and I don't know about you but I feel really like protective of my experiences and like and it's like I don't want them to be re-scripted yeah. into something which is going to be claiming that there's some like special unique woundedness about women that you can only understand if you've been a 13 year old girl yeah. you know or whatever your entire life which I think can be really difficult so I I know what you mean it's like that difficulty. How do you how do you present an idea of painfulness, which is yeah. kind of collective, without doing that? Because the because it it doesn't because the pain is still pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like what you do with it, and and who's allowed to speak about the pain, and whose pain is sort of ignored and not listened to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I I I don't know because. Um, yeah, because the pain existed long before. Like the movement came along and Mm -hmm. it's yeah (laughs) but I think yeah really successfully like the I think there's that great Amboya quote I think from an interview I hope I'm remembering it right where she says something like um womanhood or maybe like femininity um is like having a passport to a country that I've never visited or like have a citizenship to a place I've never been it's like obviously that disidentification with with like what a strictly kind of hetero womanhood is is kind of universal experience obviously but the book i think like you're from 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 being an infant or from being a daughter through to being like a tenant to being like an actress like all these like identities <laughs> that you take on like there is this kind of like sense of you which is very unique to me as a reader where it's like you've graduated into a world where you're like is this how we're doing stuff like you always seem to be and it's very comic like I th- i'm thinking of like particularly the chapter where you go to that bizarre party with like 
um, oh, it's like very so, very close to patriarchy. So it's like there's a king or there's like a royal there or something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And like <laughs> yeah. your it's, it's, not a, it's not a king there. The no, king's, the king's there. <laughs> I went to a king's land. In one of the, yeah, but you know, there's like a sense of like <laughs> these institutions of patriarchy. Like there's a military and that, and then yeah. and then you are this like very precocious thirteen year old who is like scrutinizing life, you know, for information about like I guess gendered gendered life there's like a great line i think where you say something like um the bunting was like was was like festooned everywhere the wives could reach or something like that which is like <laughs> captures this bathos where you're like looking around going like okay so this is how women behave this is how men behave but it, it's very clear that that both are kind of ridiculously performative yeah. and kind of completely camp and extreme and you don't really belong yeah which is also like weirdly i think to do with choosing cake as well yes this exactly, symbol yeah. of like yeah sort of cloying frilly sort of patronizing sugary thing which is meant to wield out celebrations and and um weirdly it also made me think about um because i've been because i've been rereading so much of susie Orbach's stuff um, because she'd been such a big influence on me and um, helped me to heal. That um, a lot of her stuff, a lot of the writing is um, about how sort of eating disorders can be a way of saying no to the to the this grown up bizarre world mm-hmm. you suddenly find yeah. yourself entering. Which is it just made me think of that when you talked about that chapter that um, that sort of the body becomes an expression of um i don't i didn't really sign up for this this yeah this i don't want to enter not as simple as i don't want a grown-up body therefore i don't want to be a woman but i think there's something it's almost that <laughs> no it is it's like it's like i i refuse to like metabolize this i would rather yeah re- you know yeah and yeah. i don't and like i guess specifically with like the binging and the purging that comes up in in the middle section it's like i'll take it on in public, but in private, I'll reject it. I think that's yeah. like, that's like really interesting. And also being ill is kind of a bit like s- saying, no, I don't want to sort of have a mortgage and yeah, I like refusing to, to work. Like, yeah. Married and I don't want to do all these things. I, I, I just, I'll stay in bed and I'll be really weak. Yeah. And unproductive. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's a line as well in that chapter where there's, there is a big cake, the cake in that chapter, it, I think you say something like, it's there to be wheeled out and if necessary eaten mm, mm. which is like so someone funny. actually gave me that line I really, <laughs> yeah i must admit but and i took it but i think <laughs> maybe um thinking about like cake as something or like saying no to eating something as as an adolescent characteristic maybe slightly obscures another truth which is like in society at large cake is there to be yeah. like seen and not digested and yeah. There's and and the kind of um, lack of pleasure, the like denial yeah, of absolutely pleasure and joy. So it's kind of universalized. It's cer- certainly at that like yeah, in and that it, space. It's amazing. I think that only once um, I began to resolve some of my difficulties with food did I realize that eating had never been pleasurable for me, and it had never been about pleasure. Even when you're eating all the wrong foods, it's rarely ever you know about. Even with something like binging, which is interesting, because I don't, I just don't think many people talk about it. I think because it's so shameful <laughs> um, that it, I suppose, because it's synonymous with sort of being greedy and you know it's so misunderstood. But I don't know, I don't mm-hmm. know how it's yeah. perceived in the. But um, it's so, it's almost trying to make the food disappear, and it's not about you know pleasure at all. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I think cakes on display and women not eating them is really the perfect yeah symbol yeah. <laughs> of the <whole> book. <laughs> and um, you know what what's what you're giving yourself permission. And also, I think when I think about the message, I the message that daughters get from mothers about um, what you should expect mm-hmm. and what you're allowed to eat and. So then, I guess, in the process of writing, did you feel like a lot of kind of the shame that you're describing was around writing about specifically food? 
I think it's something about letting other people in on how you feel about your um, body is mm-hmm. really vulnerable. Or like letting people in on the, the inner dialogue and the little games and the strange bargaining I have to play with myself mm-hmm. in order to just like eat normally is, yeah. is really... I guess because it's so private and eating problems by nature are usually so, so like to do with privacy and ritual and shame and and obsession and um writing about all of that is is it's like shining light on on it mm-hmm. in this way that it feels like totally counterintuitive when you have it yeah i think that's what yeah it but then at the same time i guess because you describe like as an actress as well being in these situations where you completely don't own your body and you don't own how it's yeah. perceived um yeah. n- well and that's true of lots of forms of work that mm. are less of ob- less obviously i mean even even when you're like behind the counter at the beauty bar i think there's a scene where you're like told to go oh, and, like yeah. hide in the background because you eye. don't yeah look, yeah look right <laughs> yeah so like yeah. there is this like very real sense in which you don't obviously own your own body so then like in the writing of it do you reclaim some ownership of of that or is it more just like being you know, giving away, does it feel more like giving away control and inviting people to perceive? Yeah, that that's the thing I'm not totally sh- sure of mm-hmm. because sometimes I would think, um, oh, I can only write about this because I, I can only write about uh, this painful stuff because I'm through it and then I can sort of turn it into something more powerful and useful it feels like it's being of use, but I don't know if that if that feels... It kind of feels powerful, I think, that I'm doing something with it. Yeah. This is a question which I think comes up a lot in the book as well, which is like, and in the reading of it, which is like, is it right to say, and I don't know the answer to this, that like writing about something really well or like writing about it in a way that is clear, like will resonate, like is funny, will make you money, like all these questions, like is that... Is that in any real way like an overcoming of um, like difficulty? And I don't know the answer, but it feels to me like it is. Like there's so many occasions in the book where it seems as though like these painful experiences are in some way redeemed by like the pleasure that you create through reading about them. But I don't know if that's, that's a false a nice thought. economy. It, well, it, the 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 question of like overcoming it's it's difficult because I also feel like that it's not there's no neat kind of bow at the end in that a lot of stuff I'll probably be dealing with the rest of my life (laughs) but and it's funny that it's so much um was quite a dark thing to say but I'll say it because um because it's part sort of depression and memoir at times and then part grief memoir and um I think that grief it's kind of like in the the Freud essay in mourning and melancholy about like you know that mourning tends to come to an end yeah and depression is you know doesn't really have a shape um so in some ways I feel like I end on sort of saying uh oh you know you can get you can get through mourning it's okay there are you can come out stronger um whereas depression is a trickier thing and there's no sort of neat resolution and a friend of mine did once say to me that they felt like and they'd lost like the love of their life and they said that their depression was worse, <laughs> which always really freaks me out. But I sort of get it. <laughs> that depression at its worst is worse than grief, <laughs> which I just like kind of blew my mind at the time. Like, really, your self hatred is worse, is more painful than losing someone you love. Okay, mm-hmm. that's interesting. That's um, really scary. It is really scary, isn't it? <laughs> but so in some ways, I, I, I don't. I, I think I'm over. I think. Finding my voice, as cheesy as that sounds, has helped to overcome a lot of things. Mm-hmm. A lot of things. Because, like, going back to this question... Well, as I remember that, that essay about mourning and melancholia, like, one of the things that's specifically um, associated with, like, the melancholy subject is they've never successfully got over the, like, depressing trauma in infancy where you realise yeah. that you don't control your parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, in that brings me back, I guess, to this question that your therapist raised about writing in your in male violence or protecting your father. And I wonder if, like, in a very literal way, I guess, writing the story, you you being able to decide what to include and what not to include, is a kind of reclamation of some sort of power over 
them because it's yeah. your story to tell. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that that's been um, yeah, like like getting to be the author. Yeah, is oh, yeah. is um, in the author of one's life. Yeah, <laughs> by by right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and even in a very um, sort of practical sense that I got to turn other things down because I had to. Um, I had to. I could say no to things I didn't want to do because I knew that I had to do this chunk of writing and right. I had to dedicate time to it and I had to take myself really seriously by doing that and that's quite revolutionary and, that's amazing and even like there's a there's a chapter the chapter about cancer where it every sentence starts with I think was deliberate because I hate saying what I think so I sort of forced myself to do this thing where I would sound really authoritative knowing that it would be really good for me yeah because <laughs> it was sort of my worst nightmare yeah and um Occasionally, when I'm talking about it, someone will quote something back to me, and I'll kind of giggle with how like high status it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I sound like a lunatic. But also, when it's just you and your laptop going for it, you you, you forget that someone's going to read this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me think about the chapter where you like rewrite into your old email exchange. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. which I think maybe you said like everyone wants to talk about because it's such a iconic chapter in the book I want to say everyone it's like 10 people <laughs> well, but like with that it's like you, it, it's it's interesting because it's like you're writing back into something which you previously wrote in a state of like such abjection and like dissociation and that you like are so you have to like make up pretend jobs and like pretend like <laughs> bosses and stuff and then you, you go back over it and I guess you kind of produce something which is quite authoritative. I mean, of your experience, when you read it, you, 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 you can't help but like really identify with, with you. And you, I guess, I mean, that's this question is like, can you go back to periods in your life where you were so traumatized that you also alienated that you really felt like you had no power at all and kind of yeah, excavate something? <clears throat> well, it's scary because uh, what's really great is that I, I can hardly identify with that that person now, and that and even actually going back over it, may, that was that felt really good to realise. Oh my god, you know, like what was I doing? What was mm-hmm. I thinking? Um, that that was so normal to me back then, and that that feels like progress. Yeah. To to, to not identify with that. Yeah, because I really person. identify with it, so I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> it's very painful to think that you could. Uh, be living your life like that in such a mess and that you didn't think to tell anyone and no one Mm, was sort of I wasn't no one was helping me that I think that's quite it feels like sort of lonely and yeah you know isolated and which again is I think about um, to do with privacy as well and how like it you can have too much privacy and it can be really bad for you (laughs) so I've kind of gone to the other extreme um, yeah, I right. think because I was always so like full of secrets. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because actually in that section, I think you're so unprotected. Like all the people that might be looking out for you, like your doctor, seems like hasn't really taken that much care of the medication that you're being prescribed, yeah. and the landlord yeah. is letting like people yeah. break in and it's things break like, down. And there's no one, there's no figure yeah. who's like looking out. I guess there's no yeah, yeah. editor who loves you. You know what I mean? In that, yeah, in that absolutely. Sense. God, yeah, it's. Exactly, no editor, that, no editor in the sky that loves you. Um, it's fun. I mean, we'll probably have to cut this out, but like, it is funny that no one with antidepressants, that no one tells you about how hard it's going to be when you come off them. Yeah. <laughs> like, I really wish... I was about to say, that they're addi- I don't think they're addictive. I think it's just that the, the come down is so extreme. So wait, are you talking... Because there's also like opioid painkillers, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah that too. <laughs> I was just saying that. I forgot about that. I mean that, yeah, that which was, is really extraordinary to read and think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, and I think I said this in the book. There was a point where I completely, without any melodrama, just very logically said to my friend, "I'm going to stay on them." Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to stay on them. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's. I'll just stay on them. What have I got another sixty years? Like that. That'll do. Yeah. That seemed like the easier option than than going through withdrawal. Yeah, so. I actually really like them. This probably also has to be cut out. But remember, my a close friend who was really suffering with a with with 
a psychiatric disorder sort of saying asking me to explain why normal life was better than what she was going through and I was like <laughs> yeah. uh, you know you, know, yeah. you never expect to have to advocate yeah. for like the way things are which obviously <laughs> screwed up like advocate if I was a friend, for I'd be sobriety like, yeah, yeah exactly right. but it's a good qu- but the other day I was talking about all the benefits I'd got from being on antidepressants and my friend did say to me why aren't you on them now I was like ah uh, Oh, so that I can sort of feel all my sad feelings as well. <laughs> it's like, what a crap answer. <laughs> so I can feel sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never been on them. I don't know what kind of, like, but then you're, so you can dissociate from your sadness in so many other ways than like medication. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I was, um, I was thinking when I was writing as well about how imagination and fantasy and escape is what I've been doing since I was little so yeah. in some ways it helps you know if you if you're going to decide that writing a book is is your you know it, it it well it felt like um because things were happening to me whilst I was writing the book that I'd have to sort of stop and include them like new deaths and so on the book became like a really useful form of dissociation from mm-hmm reality yeah at the time which yeah. I think is healthy-ish yeah all kinds of <laughs> mechanisms you could have I mean it's a good one yeah but also thinking that um the right this sort of speaker wasn't me anyway that it was just like there's there's me the person and me the the writer who's mm-hmm. writing this which is something that Sheila Hetty said in an interview about um you know she it, the the cat she calls she's called Sheila but she's like this narrator who mm-hmm. happens to be called Sheila and I thought yeah that's kind of how I feel <laughs> that's interesting do you yeah. think you feel that like equally across different chapters of the book or does the detachment kind of move in and out that's a good that's a really good question I don't know no I think it's like a a necessary protective thing and at the beginning as well um because I'm so used to like acting at the beginning it was kind of like I'm going to have to pretend to be a writer in order to write this otherwise Mm -hmm. it won't happen like I'm going to have to put on this sort of I'm going to have to act like a writer I'm going to have to sort of sit like a writer I'm going to have to you know dress like a writer whatever Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it did require a bit of acting to sort of for me to kind of really believe it was happening and I I hadn't done any work and I went to a friend's book launch and just sort of had a panic attack in the loo because I hadn't really believed it was actually that I really had to write it. It was like a year in. (laughs) I was like, oh God, oh God, it's real. (laughs) But so did it get, did you then feel like more, did you inhabit that role more as you you wrote more pages? Because um, this writing this forced me to start reading more seriously and reading in a completely new way because before writing this book I read in this kind of like oh let's see what's on the book along list oh yeah I'll read one of them without realizing that I had without being discerning or having the confidence to say oh well I can that's won an award but I don't like that I like this right so to discover that I had taste certain I mean I don't mean I have good taste I mean discover what my taste was was really really helpful because I was just trying to convince someone that I could you know write a good sentence so that was really like life-changing um but also reading has been more helpful as as helpful if not more helpful than like reading self-help which I used to do which I think is really great but then you were saying about kind of it not having a bow at the end yeah what was I saying oh yeah 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 and Um, there's a feeling of like at the end I mean I guess we talked about the the scene of the beach at the end yeah kind of having this you know it's like at the end of the book when you are invited to think of a kind of concrete end at the end of the book you that kind of prompts maybe you to find this other location where on the one hand you are at the end of something like you're at a terminus of sorts but on the other hand you're confronted with the idea that things are kind of infinite and come in waves and it really seems to play into like the feeling at the end of the book which is I think is that that Samuel Beckett quote I yeah can't go on but I I will I can't (laughs) go on I can't go on I'll go on 
Yeah, and a kind of like invitation to embrace contradiction, I guess, an ending and also not. It's funny, like, I, this sounds made up, but I knew it would end with that quote at the beginning. That's all I knew. (laughs) That's all I knew was that quote. Because I'd seen it, I'd never read the the book, but um, I I saw it as a painting, that quote. It was just written in a painting about five years ago and mm. I, I don't know I just thought about it ever since because I, I sort of found it funny yeah like the abruptness of it I found funny it's yeah. so sort of like yeah go on then um, <laughs> I can't go on I go on yeah it sounds almost like someone like a kind of dame at the side of a stage being like I can't <laughs> yeah. opine on it yeah like, there's just as some, well as something really something darker like comical about how like the switch is so quick I don't know yeah. it just kind of really pleases me um and, uh, yeah, it's kind of theatrical. I never thought about mm-hmm. that, actually. It is. Um, and then, so it, it was really strange how I had that quote, and then waves came after that. That's the, so interesting. The sort of to and froing of waves. Yeah, because um, I guess the truth is, like, maybe part of what captures the absurdity of it is, like, I can't go on, I'll go on. It's like, I can't go on, go on but I, ha- ha- I have to, I don't have a choice. Like, you don't yeah. really have a choice. Yeah. To not trapped. go on at any point, except <laughs> yeah. for, like, real Madeira. Yeah, and also because um, it was my mum's favourite beach, and because I mentioned it early on in the book, and because, and I can't remember if this is in, but I, when I knew she was dying, there were so many times I tried to take her back to the beach, and it always failed. And it was mm. this awful feeling of, like, this is the, her last chance to, to see a beach, this is her last chance to be in nature, she's just going to die in this room, and... I couldn't physically, she was too big to like, it was too sort of awkward to get her there, which, I mean, you know, for loads of different reasons, it sounds like a really poor excuse, <laughs> but it's just, it, just for lots of complicated reasons, we couldn't quite get her to the beach, but, um, so I think that's almost like my attempt of, you know, sorry, I couldn't get you to the beach, kind of thing as well, that, mm. that I ended up, I just ended up there somehow. In, in my mind and physically but it's I, I remember you saying that you'd read lots of books at event by women that had ended in at beaches yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is really pleasing yeah well I was thinking of that Rachel Cusk trilogy and, and also um I think Megan Nolan's book Ends at the Beach too well yeah, yeah. I think I guess it's like um it's very rarely that you would I mean in, in a, something really reflective and self-aware like to say that anything ends in fact I remember like one of the books that you were talking about referencing was Bluets I think you read, read yeah. yeah and as I remember although I haven't read that book in a long time it's like this description of a process which seems like interminable is its main quality that it goes on and on <laughs> and like how long will it last and it, it it's like outsized to what originally happened but then at the end um I think she writes just like 2011 to 2014 or there's some inscription of like the time span it's a long time ago that I read it but I at that time was really struggling myself with like heartbreak and things like that and attachments and um and I wasn't there yet but that like 2011 2014 was like the most meaningful moment of the book almost it was like so it can finish you know it can finish like it was contained yeah I loved it so much I mean that inspired the chapter about about cancer because it's numbered I think one of the theories about memory and trauma is that you really really capture the you remember lots of detail but it's just really hard to access the memory it's like a really clear memory but it's very far away locked away in the back of your brain so that's why you get I suppose that's why you get little flashbacks because you're sort of it's like you're trying to bring this thing forward um but you can't quite face all of it at once, like in sort of HD. And I don't know, that, I can't remember where I read this, and so maybe it's bollocks, because it was another writer saying that that's how it, trauma works, so they weren't like an expert. But anyway, I, why am I being so apologetic for what I'm saying? Um, but that made so much sense to me. Um, and also sometimes why the, the, the description's quite sparse in the book, because... Mm-hmm. It's like I don't. I didn't really want to remember every detail. That's really interesting. Yeah, because a lot of it seems so vivid. I'm surprised. So I think I took so much out uh, that I thought was too like um, descriptive and fussy. Um, so I think of it being really sparse. But but maybe that's because some other people said it was. So I'm like, oh yeah, okay. 
I mean, I'm still doing that. I'm still just like going with whatever people say it is, <laughs> which isn't a great sign, but you know, it's, uh, I think when you've been so obsessive and buried in something, it's really hard to know what it is you've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, remind, the way you're speaking about it reminds me a bit of that Denise Riley essay that you mentioned that That's you'd read. Did you read it? Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's really disturbing. Amazing. I mean, I haven't experienced bereavement at all, so I am. I really am like the, the reader that she is addressing, which is yeah. like the person who just kind of yeah. understand. Yeah. But in that she writes a, like actually that's an example of like she writes about a real dropping off like I think there's mm. like an image early on about like a kind of falling off at the edge of the world into like yeah. a sort of like brilliant whiteness of nothingness yeah. which is like maybe I that's what got me thinking a bit about the shore and the idea that like even though you're at the end of something you're still getting something back there is still a sense of like life coming back yeah. to you but the way that she is like on the edge looking out yeah, to the abyss so is true. just so disturbing um but maybe that's because it comes before the kind of the healing or I don't know I guess that is the one true binary isn't it between life and death yeah and in yeah. other ways the book like really integrates these and dissolves these binaries I can't go on I'll go on but then like at the end of it there's just death but I don't feel yeah. like that's so <laughs> it doesn't come out strongly in the book maybe because in the writing about your parents you kind of bring them back to life a bit like yeah th there's two there's there's two amazing quotes in that well the 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 quote I love from that essay is when she talks about um, that thing between the, the dead dragging you over to their side and you dragging the dead back over to your side so that their time is now contained within your time and that's that's the the dead's time is absorbed <laughs> into your life. Right. And that, that really blew my mind as well because it made me it made me feel less bad about writing about dead people because I thought I'm I'm um, their time is mine now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that that's they may not love everything in the book, but they'd be really happy that I'm writing a book. Yeah. And that's 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 still a good thing. Yeah. That, well almost because that made sense. It was such a good quote and then not a great point afterwards. No, no, I really I mean, I think you like wrote in your email, you know, you were saying something like, How can you write about people like with a responsibility to them? especially when they're dead and I was like what do you mean especially when they're dead there's so many people I'm waiting to die so I can like really write about them it never occurred yeah. to me at all that you feel, you'd feel a continued responsibility to people after they've died so when you well, say that it makes me think I mean yeah. it's it, I think it depends like it comes back to what the therapist said about protecting because in fact I I was so worried I, I took so I took stuff out last minute because I was so worried about upsetting people and I wanted to be this rebellious you know, like transgressive, <laughs> amazing. And then I realised the night before, I'm I'm really not. I'm sort of a good girl. The night before, yeah, or like li you know, really close to the deadline anyway. That I was kind of obedient and wanted to be liked. So, um, but uh, I can't remember what my point was. Oh yeah, but then my friend said, I don't know what you're worrying about. Have you read Lily Allen's book? <laughs> She's like, yours is a love letter to people. Like, what are you on about? And then I was pissed off. I was like, oh, I failed. Uh -huh. I've just written a love letter to right. these dead people. That's not what I wanted to do. You can always write a sequel. <laughs> Hate mail. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs>